Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. All right, John, it's your turn. What did you pick? I picked a story by Lori Moore called Referential. And you got a section for us? I do. Now she and Pete went to see her son without the jams, but with a soft, deckle-edged book about Daniel Boone, pulled from her own bookcase, which was allowed, even though her son would believe that it contained messages for him, believe that, although it was a story about a long-ago person, it was also the story of his own sorrow and heroism in the face of every manner of wilderness, defeat, and abduction, that his own life could be draped over the book, which was simply a noble armature for the revelation of tales of him. There would be clues in the words and pages with numbers that added up to his age, 97, 88, 466. There would be other veiled references to his existence. There always were. They sat at the visitor's table together, and her son set the book aside and did try to smile at both of them. There was still sweetness in his eyes, the sweetness he'd been born with, even if fury could dart in a scattershot fashion across them. Someone had cut his tawny hair, or at least had tried. Perhaps a staff person hadn't wanted the scissors to stay near him for a prolonged period, and had snipped quickly, then leaped away, approached again, grabbed and snipped then jumped back. That's what it looked like. Her son had wavy hair that had to be cut carefully. Now it no longer cascaded down, but was close to his head, springing out at angles that would likely matter to no one but a mother. So where have you been? Her son asked Pete. Good question, Pete said, as if praising the thing would make it go away. How could people be mentally well in such a world? Do you miss us? The boy asked. Pete did not answer. Do you think of me when you look at the black capillaries of the trees at night? I suppose I do. Pete stared back at him so as not to shift in his seat. I am always hoping that you are okay and that they treat you well here. Do you think of my mom when you stare up at the clouds and all they hold? Pete fell silent again. That's enough, she said to her son, who turned to her with a change of expression. There's supposed to be cake this afternoon for someone's birthday, he said. That will be nice, she said, smiling back. No candles, of course, or forks. We'll just have to grab the frosting and mash it into our eyes for blinding. Do you ever think about how, at that moment of the candles, time stands still, even as the moments carry away the smoke? It's like the fire of burning love. Do you ever wonder why so many people have things they don't deserve, but how absurd all those things are to begin with. Do you really think a wish can come true if you never, ever, 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 ever tell it to anyone? That was my favorite line. (laughs) Yeah. uh, I underlined it, that whole section, but that line is my favorite one. So why'd you pick this story? Uh, I picked this story because I was um, trying to pick a story and it was Uh called Lori Moore. Uh Lori Moore's a good writer. We haven't done her a story by her for a long time. So I'm going to do another one that wasn't a uh, one of those uh, second person mock imperative stories that we did of hers before. What was the other one called? How to Become a Writer. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Had you read this one before? Or you just came across it, you said? That's a good question. I don't remember if I'd read it before. When I was reading it, and you can cut this if it doesn't make sense, but when I was reading it, the part about like the jams, bringing the jams to like a guy in a mental ward, I was like, is that that same other story that we read? That's another reason I picked. Okay. I started reading this and I was like, wait a second. I was like, in the other one, it was the dad. Like they were married, I think. But that was also your story. And that was relatively recent, I want to say. Yeah, it was within the past year or so, too. Yeah. This story, there's a reason it's called referential, is it is a retelling of that Nabokov story. Okay. Signs and symbols. Yeah. Uh, it was published as Symbols and Signs and also as Signs and Symbols. He had two versions. One in Oh, that's darker, right. I remember one, that, yeah. Yeah. So I never remember which one is which or which one we did. We did the one from the New Yorker that was online. But yeah. But yeah, this is basically just a retelling of that with some things changed. And I didn't say anything when I sent it. No, I definitely didn't know that it was like, verb- you know, like a retelling. But I was like, this is the exact same premise. And they bought, they brought jelly. <laughs> that's right well now i have to reevaluate what i'm thinking in real time which it's gonna be slow it's gonna be a long <laughs> episode no so in the other one though are they married yeah it, his parents are married okay they're older yeah like my takeaway from this one what i came away with from this story like the meaning and everything was this version seemed like it was mostly about the mother and it was about you know how she's got both a ghost of a son and a ghost of a partner i feel like the other version felt like a story about the son in the war because both the parents cared deeply about him. Yeah, it's more about her 
than it than the other one was, which was more about them together. Right. And then therefore their relationship with their son. It's a different focus. Yeah, absolutely. Which was probably part of why, like by the end, I was able to like completely forget about that other one. Like when I started <laughs> reading this, I was like, oh, there's a lot of similarities. <laughs> and I was like, but it's a different story. So I stopped like comparing at some point, but now it does make sense. Like I think the other one ends with like a similar phone call too. Okay. So she did copy this story from that copy it but like it is taken really specifically from the Nabokov story. It's, the Nabokov story starts for the fourth time in as many years they were confronted with the problem of what birthday present to bring a young man who was incurably deranged in his mind and this story starts for the third time in three years they talked about what would be a suitable birthday present for her deranged son <laughs> You can see already in the first line, like the way she's changing it, it's her son. It's not um, their son. Well, they didn't even, it's not even, it's referred to as a young man who was incurably right. deranged, but it pretty much hits beat for beat, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. I wanted to read these two paragraphs from the two, just as a, for a comparison's sake. In uh, the Nabokov one, there's a paragraph that says, the last time he had tried to do it, his method had been, in the doctor's words, a masterpiece of inventiveness. He would have succeeded seated had not an envious fellow patient thought he was learning to fly and stopped him. What he really wanted to do was to tear a hole in his world and escape. And then in Lori Moore's version, she writes, the last time her son had tried to do it, his method had been, in the doctor's words, morbidly ingenious. He might have succeeded, but a fellow patient, a girl from group, had stopped him at the last minute. There had been blood to be mopped. For a time, her son had wanted only a distracting pain, but eventually he had wanted to tear a hole in himself and flee through it. Life for him was full of spies and preoccupying espionage, yet sometimes the spies would flee as well, and someone might have to go after them over the rolling fields of dream into the early morning mountains of dawning signification in order, paradoxically, to escape them altogether. It's almost in certain places verbatim, but she's adding and subtracting and making it something new, which is endlessly fascinating. The New Yorker published the first one too. Yep. 1956. And then this one in what, 2012 or something like that. All right. So I guess if enough time passes, you can like lift a story verbatim <laughs> and call it your own. And... It's Novokov, right? When we talked about that story, we mentioned how it's on these lists of like the 10 best short stories in the 20th century. And like, that's number one, symbols and signs, herb. Yeah. It's up there usually. Well, I don't know. I think it's probably like if you're a good writer and she is. Oh, yeah. This was easy. <laughs> it's easy. You know, <laughs> it is. I think it is. When you're given what is already considered a classic and you're not reinventing the wheel at all, like you have things like jams and a phone call. I mean, it's not hard to like reinvent the family dynamics that make it your own. Yeah. I'm less interested in discussing this story now. <laughs> I mean, like this would be a prompt that I would give like and I will. This is now my new takeaway which would be to pick a classic New Yorker story and update it to make it modern. I don't even think this is like necessarily modern. No. The dynamics might be like where there's like a stepdad figure, but it's not like there's cell phones or, you know, like she's getting a missed call on her cell phone. It's still a landline. I mean, one of the things in this story and the other story, the parents are unable to visit their son because he had an incident on his birthday and they yeah. go in and they're like, I'm sorry, because they were late. A whole bunch of bad stuff happened. Like the train stopped and then they, got there late and they said well something happened and you're not gonna be able to see him today so they go home and they're sad and that's like the story then this one they get there and and like the section i read is them actually talking with him and they actually you actually right. see them interact and see how he relates with pete and how she relates with pete and kind of like hinting at the dynamics there so it's a little little different here and there it's definitely like you said picking a different focus right the relationship yeah I don't know, like it's still well done and everything. It's still like definitely done. But now that I know that it's like a direct, I'm like wondering, you know, so much of what gives a story a tone or a feel or whatever is like when you choose to be in the present tense, when you choose to like do a flashback, like how you choose to like unspool the facts. That's what I mean when I say this must have been easy because I don't think she was really making those choices. I think like the structure of the story was the blueprint. And then like what she changed was what we said, like the family dynamics, which within the blueprint, it's just, you know, when to swap and sub the information. And yeah, yeah, this is cheating. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think it's 
she's finding out what to say about this set of characters that is different. Yeah. And she changes the characters a little bit because they're her characters now. They're not hit, uh, Nabokov's characters anymore. Right. But all the little details don't need to change much. There's little things like, you know, the symbols and signs one had a bunch of like weird symbolism or apparent possible symbolism yeah. with like the cards and photographs that fell on the floor stuff like that so she included little hints of those too but this one doesn't read in the same way that like referential mania that Nabokov focused on in the in his right he kind of mentions that her son has that problem in that section I read but that's not the focus of it right it's not no about this referential mania and like trying to find a meaning in something that has no meaning which I think is what right. we talked about in that episode right this is more just oh, what are these characters like yeah that makes sense well, what else do you like about this one? I like the brazenness of it, and I like uh, I like that it's really well written. <laughs> yes, it is brazen, right? I mean, like this is the other thing <laughs> that I'm like. It's so similar that it's like, why? Why? Why did you do this? Yeah. The only thing I can kind of think about or compare it with is uh, if you read like the Greeks, the Greek uh, tragedies, you know, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, they all have like their own, like there's like Aeschylus wrote an Oedipus story, Sophocles wrote an Oedipus story. Uh, They all have written an Orestes story. They all take like some situation from Greek mythology and write their own story or their own play, their own tragedy about that character in that situation this is the comparison that i come to i I go i reach for where it's it doesn't matter that they're all taking the same story they're finding something new in it they're doing something different with it their version of it says something or or explores some aspect of that situation that's different than what other people have done before sure and so this kind of thing where you take somebody else's work (laughs) and you redo it from your own point of view i mean that would be the reason to do it because you want to find something new in it Yes. Not because a New Yorker called you and said, I mean, we need a story. And you're like, I don't know. Let me just steal this one from the And they're like, Nobody will really? notice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, there is something new to this for sure. It's just, I don't know how new it really is. I mean, the, the focus of the story is different. I'm trying to think of other, like, do we have another example of when this has been done, except for just like the Greek stuff that you're mentioning? Like Joyce Carol Oates did uh, The Lady with the Pet Dog, which was a retelling of a oh. of a Chekhov story. Oh, we should, we should look at that. Well, that's an example. In the Joyce Carol mm-hmm. Oates one, she kind of re, I don't remember the details. It's been years since I read them, but she kind of refocused it to find a different thing to, to to explore in that in the situation which uh i think would be a fascinating one we should do it we definitely should try to do an episode on it yeah i'd be game just because i'm sure this is something that like lots of people do whether or not it gets published in the new yorker so it would be good to to look at what works I mean, I'm not saying this does not work. This on its face is like a great story. It's just like so much of it is obviously like structurally and like premise wise and everything. It's like, you know, verbatim. What do you think about like that example, those paragraphs where it's almost identical language? Yeah. What do you think of that? (sighs) That's what I don't like. Like as a journalist, like that's the kind of language you get fired for. I mean, you get fired for that kind of that kind of language, even when it's like narrative, even when it's not the most powerful part of your story. And it wasn't like a direct quote. It wasn't like you weren't commenting somehow with it. You know, people will be lazy just about the way they describe things. So passages like that, when they are that similar, I'm just like, it was probably so much more work to change it that little than, it, than to just like reimagine the story without referring to it i wonder i I have two thoughts about it first of all nabokov is such a a, like a perfectionist about his style i can see coming upon sentences you're like i can't there's nothing i can do about this sentence i I can't improve it it is a perfect sentence what am i going to do i'm going to steal it the other thing though is that in this kind of literary writing it's not journalism it's not the same as other kinds of things i think those kinds of rules shouldn't apply to it in the same way like you could take something that somebody else has done and riff on it Yes, that's what's being done here because it's overt. But that kind of thing, that kind of activity of writing and being inspired by something like that, I think is that is something that you could, can, and should be able to do with literary art that you shouldn't be able to do in journalism. No, totally. The other part, though, that bothers me when you're 
you're re-engineering a paragraph that's like so close to being not yours. It's like, why did you refer to it at all? Why didn't you try to rewrite this in a completely different way? If you cannot hope to make it much different, then what are you doing? Just make the outline and then just like have the main beats there, yes. but don't look at the old language. This is the other thing that I've said about journalism. Not that it's two completely unrelated thoughts, but all of my thoughts come from having done that work is you almost always write a better story. It's easier to write. The flow makes more sense when you don't refer to your notes constantly. Yeah. I don't, you know, the, the paragraph I read, the, the one of the changes she made was uh, his method had been in the doctor's words, a masterpiece of inventiveness. And then, then Lori Moore's one, his method had been in the doctor's words, morbidly ingenious. I don't think that the part of that that's the same is very important. Okay. Uh, if that makes sense. I know what you mean. The last phrase of those of that sentence is where it differs. And that's where the, the interesting thing happens in the story. Right. So I think as long as you're not stealing metaphors or stealing uh, that kind of stuff, like I'm sure if you did a survey of all English texts, you would find the same, like she walked up the stairs and opened the door a billion times, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. It's like, yeah. That's what happened in a billion different stories. And that's how somebody's going to express it a billion times yeah i do want to read this this uh joyce carol oates and the that one is a translation the checkoff is definitely transient yes. so that's going to be different yeah it'll be different but i guess it'll also like depending on how dramatic her choices were in comparison to the original like i'll know better whether what Lori is doing here is like what's to be expected when you do this kind of work Here's my takeaway. <laughs> okay. My takeaway is to do this exact thing. Yep. And I guess I would say like, you'll be increasingly memorable if you can be like much different than the original in one obvious aspect, you know, like different point of view, maybe, or like different time period, different cultural, whatever. Part of why I've always liked the stories that we've read here, like Cat Person and the other one that was like that was about dating. Like, this is how you leave him or this is how you ghost, fail to ghost. Oh, I, I almost got a title right. But stories like that, I love because the sentiments, the dynamics whatever, are so similar to so many millions of love stories that you've ever read. And what makes them stand out is like the time period, like the relevancy. So pick a really old New Yorker story that was really popular, shorter the better, and rewrite it, but make it like super modern and just see what happens there. Like making it super modern, I think is enough for it to be like worthy of rewriting. The girls in their summer dresses. Yes. I've thought about that. I thought about that one, like, cause I shared it on Facebook, but the reason I first came across that was because the New York Times wrote a story with yeah. that headline and they were referring to the boys in their summer dresses and it was like a story about men in fashion wearing dresses and like I mean that's a story for an LGBTQ writer you know who could do it like much better than I could but like that's your premise that's updating it like guys on the town looking at other guys like you don't even need to refer to the original like but it's referential because you'll be like extracting the same sentiments but for like a modern audience you know yeah so that yeah someone should do that exact story okay <laughs> Boy. I, I want a gay writer to write that. So that's my takeaway. Uh, what is yours, Sean? Well, yeah, your takeaway. I mean, the moment I picked this story, I knew the, I didn't even have to reread it to know that that was the takeaway. That's the oh, only obvious takeaway, right? The only obvious takeaway. So that's it's my the only obvious thing you could do. Yeah. But I wanted to mention it in a slightly different way because one of the things that Lori Moore does with this is she doesn't just copy any old buddy. She copies one of the, you know, in the pantheon of great writers. Yes. She picks one of his best stories and takes that and does that. So if you as a, if we're trying to be a fiction writer, I think we should aim for the best we can possibly do. Try to be better than you think you can. And trying to like rewrite someone who's that good of a story. Right. Just the process of doing that, even if you don't come up with something that's like publishable. Yes. You will learn about their story. You'll learn about how they right. put it together by trying to copy it, by trying to like break it down and redo it in your own way. Right. You'll learn so much about like how you put stories together and probably figure out little things that will help you in the future for stories. So I think just the exercise of it is enough to just take someone, one of the best stories you've ever read and try to rewrite it. I think that would be a great little exercise. Yeah, totally. You're right in that you'd learn something. And I just want to point out that uh, you could easily retool your takeaway like as an excuse the next time you're caught plagiarizing. <laughs> I right. just want it. I'm looking up to the greats. I've learned so much. Yeah, if, if you go to court over this kind of thing, listeners, then <laughs> You know, just reference our podcast. We'll get more people to listen. <laughs>
Uh, I was assigned this. It's not plagiarism. Uh, I titled my story referential, which means I could do whatever I want. <laughs> it's called yeah. I stole this story. And yeah, uh, people will think, wow, what a great art piece. Yeah. It's not my fault. A uh, bunch of modern readers don't know how to Google. <laughs> All right. Thanks guys. You should have told me you should, you should have been like, have you read it yet? And I would have been like, yeah. And then you would have been like, does it remind you of anything? I would have been like, yeah. And then you should be like, you should go read it. And then I would have, and then maybe I would have had something nicer to say about Lori. <laughs> yeah. I should have done that. That's right. No, it's fine. I am like every other listener. I'm sure where it's like, <laughs> that's familiar. If you enjoyed this episode, consider joining our Patreon. Your support helps us keep the show running. Find out more at patreon.com slash why is this good podcast. And for industry news, writing tips, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop. You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter at napleswritersworkshop.com.